Hello everyone, welcome to Beyond the Veil. Today, we hear from Debbie Alley, a published author and trauma counselor who survived a terrifying home invasion and near-death experience. Her story of abduction, spiritual encounters, and ultimate survival brings a profound message of hope and resilience that will inspire. My name is Debbie Alley. I am a published author, a ghostwriter, I also write uh, screenplays, done extensive counseling, uh, more specifically with women who have suffered trauma, PTSD, et cetera, et cetera. And that came about as a result of the story I'm about to tell you. My near-death experience occurred on my 31st birthday. That was December 5th, 2006. Um, yes, literally on my birthday, which messed up all my other days thereafter. I was on a really tiny little island called uh, Trinidad in the Caribbean. I was, fortunately, I was home alone. My two kids were very young at the time. My son was eight, my daughter was six. So for my birthday, they decided to run out with their daddy and plan something or the other. But I remained home alone because I love Christmas and I was cleaning. Unfortunately, that morning, um, I left my garage door open for no more than maybe five or ten minutes because I, I was in the process of doing some Christmas cleaning. And uh, I felt relatively safe because there were neighbors around doing the same thing, uh, road workers around, etc. However, when I saw them starting to, you know, leave their homes and whatnot, I decided to pack up and return inside my home. And within, I would estimate maybe 10 seconds of my turning my back to the door and about to hit the close button, two men invaded my home. They were wearing masks. Uh, one was holding like a machete type blade and the other was holding a gun. And they came in and before I could blink, you know, blood dropped to my toes. I went cold, I froze, and the gun was to my head. So, yes, I was abducted from my home and held captive for two weeks, which totally confuffled the police and the anti-kidnapping squad because uh, usually uh, a hostage is held, you know, maximum one week if no ransom has been paid by that time. And yet still I was alive. During that two week period where my husband was negotiating on one end, you know, unspeakable things were done to me. I was brutalized and beaten by these men. And, and I'm relatively tiny in stature, like five feet. Uh, of course I was a lot slimmer then, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. And uh, so they beat me a lot trying to get information. I was starved. I was dehydrated. I was mauled by some breed of pit bull. Really uh, took a toll on me to the point where I went into shock several times. And I, I, I knew that I was going into shock because I felt the onset of it. I was handcuffed. I saw no light for uh, 14 days and 14 nights. I saw no light. My feet were tie strapped. My my hands were handcuffed to uh, like a bedpost type thing. Um, I was allowed uh, within the two week period. I was allowed maybe two showers max. Um, there were bathroom issues, etc. But having grown up the way I grew up, which was a devout Christian, I never gave up hope. I did question God as to why this was happening to me. But I I would say maybe about day 11 or day 12 into the abduction, I use certain techniques that I now teach other women to how you, you know, different ways you can use your mind to control your body and basically keep yourself alive and to help you deal and cope with the stress and the trauma that you're enduring at that point in time. Um, but there's only so far that can go when you're in the situation. And on that morning, the individual who was guarding me, he left that morning. And I knew 
somehow that I was not going to make it. I felt my body like just really weak. So essentially, when I died, I felt in between falling asleep and fading away all at the same time. So I was me. I was Debbie, still Debbie, lying there, and I just felt really tired. And I knew, okay, Debbie, you're fading. Can you fight it? And these were the thoughts in my head. Can you fight it? And I was, there was, I just drew a blank. And I just felt myself kind of drifting off into some sort of slumber. And uh, remember, my body was in tremendous pain from the assaults, from the beatings, starvation, the mauling by the dog, all kinds of things. I was in a great deal of pain. And suddenly, in drifting off into this sleep, the pain started fading. And I was like, okay, it's kind of strange and nice. Very nice, very pleasant, but strange. And to me, it seemed like I blinked once and I was above my body. I'm still me. I'm still Debbie. I'm still aware of all of my memories and... uh, my children and, and my husband and my parents and and the situation that I was currently in, I was fully aware. I looked down and I, I'm like really confused. It's okay, so I'm here, but I'm also there. It was unnerving, but at the same time, my body, my mind, everything was in perfect, perfect condition. I looked around and I literally I saw the room that I was being held captive in even though I was you know there was this mask over my head for two weeks I saw everything in that room and I drew it hoping it would help the police but they never found it then I looked at myself and I said but that's me and I saw the position that I was lying in so the handcuffs and the clothes I was wearing everything um so I went down a little closer and I looked at my neck and my chest and I looked at you know I placed my head on my chest to trying to feel you know am I breathing you know and there was no breathing there was no movement on my chest oh crap I'm dead and the funny thing was coming to that realization was not in the least bit intimidating scary It was just a matter of stating the fact. Like, oh crap, I'm dead. But there was no panic. (laughs) And I, you know, I hovered over my body for what seemed like a few seconds. And when I just sensed another presence in the room. And then there was this amazing, unreal white light that approached me from the side. But yet I could look at it. I looked directly into the white light and there was no, didn't hurt my eyes. It didn't, you know, uh, I did not need to squint. There was nothing like that. I stared at it and this overwhelming feeling of bliss and peace. But all of a sudden it was like nothing else mattered in, in the presence of this light. And out of this light stepped Jesus, whom I love with all my heart. And I grew up as a child loving him that same way. And he stepped out of the light. And immediately I knew it was him. I I was not afraid or intimidated, but I was so humbled that I felt I should not look him directly in the face. And so I just dropped, I dropped to his feet to what at one point I thought were his sandals. But then I realized he was not wearing sandals. He was bare feet, which is why the name of my book is is called Bare Feet. He was bare feet like me. Because when I was abducted, I was not wearing any shoes. And I remember looking at his toes and the light emanating from his toes and just kind of creeping my fingers up. And I just remained at his feet. And I swear I could remain there from now until eternity and be totally complete just right there at his feet but he lifted me he lifted me up he made me stand and he held me by my shoulders 
I still could not raise my head to look into his face. Uh, later on, I, I I did glimpse his face, and there are images that I have of him in his true the likeness in which he presented himself to me. He then lifted me like he was cradling a newborn baby. So he did not hold me like an adult. He cradled me like a newborn baby fitting in, in our arms. And he said, it's okay. It's okay, child. It's all right, Debbie. You can rest now. You can sleep. It's okay. Everything's going to be all right now. And he cradled me and I snuggled in his arms like no other feeling not even in my mom's arms felt that incredible and I slept now to me that span of time was maybe maximum one minute okay at, at the time that's what I thought just like one minute had passed when I woke up I you know woke up just like a little baby I stretched and like a two-year-old will latch on to the parent over the shoulder and kind of, you know, look around at everything. That's the position I was in. He was holding me like that. And I woke up and I woke up and I was on the beaches of heaven. Uh, I had no inkling of how much time had passed. I was so acutely aware of every single thing around me it was insane and i realized that there is nothing on this earth that compares to what lies on the other side and in heaven this was my experience the colors of this earth are literally a shadow literally a shadow compared to what real color is what real life is can't find the words to aptly describe heaven but he walked on the beach and he was very silent and we communicated i asked questions and he would answer but it was telepathic i would think it and he would respond in a telepathic manner and i looked at the water and i searched everywhere possible to find that shade of blue never found it never will it does not exist on this earth i looked at the sand each grain of sand was like a crystal and i stared at it and every single grain of sand glowed and sparkled like real crystals but yet still the crystals we know is like a crayon to the sun nothing compared to it and then he put me down on the beach and I looked back and realized, wait a minute, there are no footprints. So he's walking and there are no footprints. And I questioned that in my mind and his response again telepathically was, that's because you're not supposed to go back. So he was not leaving a trail for me to follow. And I thought of my kids. I remember thinking of my kids. Oh my gosh. I can't go back to my kids. But I could not feel grief. It was as though being in his presence, grief and sadness and anything negative that you can about, it was unable to feel those emotions in his presence. I tried to feel grief for my kids. I tried to feel sad. I could not. I could not. I remember I was like a child. I squished my toes in the sand. And I could have taken one crystal of sand and been happy for all eternity. That's how spectacular it was. So there was a, there was a line, of a, a horizon line of the, the ocean out front. But where he walked, water stood still. There was a straight line on the sand. And when he continued walking, then the movement would continue very gradually. So it was like even the water stood still in his presence. The fish in the ocean stood still. The fish ref could, did not move when he passed by. I looked up and there was no sky, which was odd because, you know, there are all these scientific explanations as to what we referred to as the sky, the reflection of the ocean, etc. I didn't I did not even question that. I looked up 
And Jesus told me, there is no need for a sky. There is no need for a sky because God is, and he is, and he encompasses all things. So there was no sky, there was no sun, but there was light. There was not even a shadow. I looked at the trees around me, the rocks, uh, you know, on the, on the, on the sand, and I could not find the rocks casting a shadow. There was just light everywhere, surrounding every single object, and I wondered at that. And Jesus said to me, "I am the way, the truth, and the light. My Father and I are one." Therefore, there is no need for a sun. His light encompasses every single thing. So we got to the end of the beach and I knew, okay, something is about to happen. But that's when I started remembering all the little dreams that they had. And still, I could not feel grief. And then uh, he, just, just, he just took one step back away from me. And directly before me was an even more brilliant white light. I did not conceive that there could be anything greater than Jesus' light. But this light was like a zillion times brighter. I looked at the light, into the light. I could not see a figure, a form, nothing. There was just this brilliant light. And all that light came a voice. And I remember thinking that, oh, wow. That's the most beautiful voice I've ever heard. And again, God responded. He said to me, my voice is the sweetest sound you will ever hear, at least to those who belong to me. Jesus had asked me, why do you want to go back? And I said, my babies. And I remember I'm asking me, do you not trust me to take care of them? And then I suddenly realized that I needed to let them go and that he would take care of them way better than I ever could. And he said, okay. They will be taken care of. If I return you to earth, this is what you must do for me. About how it will be done, when and where it will get done, it will be done because it is my will. And literally in front of my face appeared an image of the book. I saw the name Bare Feet written. I saw what the cover should look like. And he said, this is the book you will write. And this is the message you will send to the world. And the message was, I see all. I hear all. I know all that happens in the darkness and the light. And this is the message that I have been delivering for the past 16 years to people all over. It's his message. And I said, yes, Lord, my life has always been yours. I will do anything and everything you ask. And his light faded. Around Jesus was standing there with this brilliant smile. And that's when I noticed his face. Brilliant, brilliant smile. He was kid excited. And he placed his right hand on my head. Remarkable warmth just flowed through my body. He was blessing me, but he was removing every injury that I had sustained, internal and external, and planting in me the strength to do what I have been doing. And he blessed me and he smiled again. And he said, everything will be Perfect. Everything will be okay now. It will not be easy, but it's okay. So he took back the way we came. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, yes, I'm going to see my babies. I'm going to see my babies. Everything will be okay. And I suddenly felt this strength inside of me, like I can conquer anything on this earth. And I began to realize that that's the way we feel on the other side. That's how, that's the way we feel in the presence of God. Like I can do this. But then when we get back to earth and reality hits, Everything gets shuffled. Everything gets screwed up, basically. But nevertheless, we walked back. And again, I looked at the water standing still as he passed, you know, refusing to move in his presence. And I, I could not look back. I wanted to look back. And I simply could not. So he kissed me on the head and said, everything will be okay. Go now. And when I turned away from him, so my back was facing him, Archangel Michael was on my left side. Jesus said that Archangel Michael will stay with me for my duration on this earth. 
because I am to be protected so I can do God's work. And I heard his sword, I heard his wings. I know him. I know him like a friend. And on my right shoulder, Archangel Gabriel was placed there. He said, call on him whenever you need guidance, wisdom, strength. And I felt he had softer wings, much softer in the way that the wings furled back. A softer presence than, than Michael. But they were both there, left and right shoulder. And in front of me, on my left side, were the saints. Abraham, Moses, Jacob. And on my right side was Mother Mary and Elisha, in that order. I could not see their faces because they were all bent in prayer. They were all praying for me. The only one that looked up at me was Mother Mary. And she smiled a mother's smile. The warmth of a mother's smile, she smiled at me. And she said, her message to the world was this. God always answers the prayer of a mother. Yes, as a mother, he was answering my prayer as a mother. But he was answering my mom because I did not know that every evening at 6 p.m., pray for my safe return. And every evening at 6 p.m., I would feel that kind of warmth come over me. I couldn't tell the time, but I would feel that warmth. And prayer is a tangible, living thing. She heard mom's prayer. That's why he answered. And I knew it was going to be okay. And then I suddenly felt very tired. And I curled up on the sand in like a fetal position. I curled up in a fetal position. And it seemed like the blink of an eye. And I was back in my body and all of the pain came back. But I knew I was going to go home. I did not know how because they had tried two times to drop the ransom money off and both times failed. I knew I died in the morning. And when I returned to my body, it was very, very late evening. To me, this whole encounter felt like 10 minutes, maybe, maybe 15 an entire day had passed. When until I returned to my body and I knew I was going to be okay. Because God had changed the same kidnapper who was brutalizing me and beating me and me. I was like Daniel in the lion's den. And when I surrendered to God like that, that man changed from a beast. And he became my protector. We started talking about all kinds of things politics and my family and his family and uh, I taught him about Jesus which he had never heard before and I remember him falling at my on my leg and like crying and begging me to forgive him which I did again that was God in me through me not me I don't give myself credit for any of this <laughs> make no mistake he begged for forgiveness he asked if he can call me his friend which I said yes. There are so many more details I could I could give, but time is not adequate. But at the end of the day, he told me, he said, Mrs. Ali, you will go home, you will see your children, and I will not let anybody hurt you. They will need to kill me first. He tried to let me go. He unbuckled me, he untied the straps. He said he was going to clear a pathway for me, and I should just run. And he did that, and I was free. I was free to go. I was completely free. I could have ripped off the mask and run. But the Lord said to me at that point in time, if you run, whomever he was working with would kill him. And he, God asked me if I wanted his blood on my hands, and I said no. And Jesus, the Lord said, I did not come here to judge. I came to save. And that's what made me sit still, did not move. And he came back in some time later, so mad that I did not run away. And he could not understand that I did that to save his life after he had done so much damage to me. And again, I don't take credit for that. I later found out that this man had kind of changed his life. He, of course, ended up in jail for on some other charges. He passed away in jail. So that's most of what my death experience was. It was some time after that I remembered the experience of returning to my body. For whatever reason, I did not remember at the time. It was like flying. I was moving through time and space with the speed of thought. I knew I was returning to my body, but the feeling, this light feeling, movement, 
through pl different planes of existence. It was indescribable freedom. And in my experience, it is what death is to those who belong to God. And I never really realized how horribly heavy this body this human body is. It's like wearing 20, 30 layers of clothing on a hot day. It, it, it's just, it's ridiculous. I never knew that my true form was that light and free and perfect and beautiful in every way until I got back in this body and I was like, oh, I need to deal with this again. Even now, sometimes I regret, oh, Debbie, you should have stayed. Why did you come back? And when life gets too difficult, sometimes I say that. I said, okay, this is God punishing me for deciding not to stay with him in heaven. Deal with it now. And, and that's what Jesus conquered when he died on the conquered death. It holds no power over me anymore. I'm, there's nothing about death that I am afraid of. It's something that I welcome. I say, okay, good. Yes, I'm one year closer to going back home. This is not home. This is a training ground, a testing ground. And that's what keeps me going daily, you know, coping with PTSD and depression and anxiety and all of those things. It's been very, very difficult for me to be able to do that and help people. But I remember that feeling of him holding me. I remember heaven. I remember the light freedom. I remember the perfection. And I know that's where I'm going. And that's the be all and end all of my bare feet. The message from God himself, the message from Mother Mary meant to give people hope and give people strength. Whether you're a Christian or not, that's what it was meant for. I remember when I was released two days after that experience, the kidnappers accepted one-tenth of the money they demanded. They could not comprehend. Why would these men keep this one woman alive for two weeks and not get not even 10-20% of what they, they demanded? And they accepted it. The kidnapper who became my protector, he did something that baffled the police as well. He gave me a phone. Of course, I had to keep it hidden. He said, listen, I'm going to drop you someplace that's very close to getting help, either a police station or a hospital. Keep this phone hidden. When we drop you off, do not speak to me. Pretend you don't know me. Just keep this phone Call your husband when you get dropped off. I remember they loaded me in the car like a sack of cement, sped down to God knows where, I don't know. Literally threw me out of a moving vehicle. I landed in a drain. Of course, immediately I pulled off my mask, but I, I literally could not see because my eyes and ears, everything was infected. I felt the, the buttons on the phone. I dialed my husband's number and he answered. And hearing his voice was just... Hearing his voice was home. He's always been kind of like home to me. They kind of traced the call and they figure out where I was. And they came and they bagged me and tagged me like I was a package and did the whole test thing. And that in itself was dehumanizing and traumatic in itself. And uh, eventually, you know, I got home and I hugged. I remember hugging the wall in my house. Uh, I didn't know, uh, you know, a building could mean so much. I remember holding on to the wall in the house and I just couldn't let go for a while. And later on in the evening, my parents, and my brother and his wife brought my kids because they had been taking care of them. And, uh, you know, I had my babies back, but I also knew, I knew what my job was. I remember the day after I was released, of course, the media was hounding us and Everyone was trying to keep them away, and I said, no, that's not why I was sent back to this world. And from the very next day, I started driving on my own. I started speaking to people, speaking to the media, giving reports. I started doing everything the day after, as weak and tired as I was, because that was that's my duty. And the Lord was ever-present in that process. And life has been very difficult after. I will not lie and sit here and pretend, oh, I've overcome, no. The only reason I'm alive now is because of strength, whatever strength my Lord gives me. And I will not sit here and pretend I do not get angry with God sometimes, because I still do. But I've continued and I've counseled many, many women um, to the point where the, the 
the police would call me hey debbie can you come and talk to these women can you come talk to this girl whatever it was private calls and i'd go out of my way and counsel them if they wanted to sometimes two three in the morning they call me they want to commit or whatever i would talk them talk them down because i know i've been to that point even though i had that encounter with jesus you would think no that would not happen yes it did because when i got back to my body i got back to this world and how horrible and cruel this world can be and dealing with the and what that did to me as a woman is that's a whole other story i know what it's like to sit there with my husband had to break down the door i would have to hide from my kids and take very long showers so i could just sit there and cry and cry and cry so they won't see of course they knew but i will tell you this the damage that is done crimes like these it's not just me it's my husband it's my mother who lost her child my father who lost his child my brother who lost his sister my children who lost their mommy and the damage that that did to them they are young adults now and still i see the damage <laughs>